So today I have with me Aaron White, the CEO of Blissfully, and who, which is now joined Vendor. Aaron, thank you very much for, for being here today and talking to me. Yeah, no, my pleasure. I'm psyched about it. So Aaron, the, the, the subject, the first subject I want to talk to you about is engineering excellence, how to build an engineering team and company that produces in significant volume, not just quantity, but also quality. And this is a challenge that most companies face. And they start off, they're just three people, three founders together. Uh, they seem to, on the prototyping level, they seem to be able to get out a lot of product um, and then to be able to put it in front of customers and then have those customers use it, like it. Okay, now it's working. Now we raise a series A or B and now we go hire lots more engineers and build out you know, many more features and also make this industrial code because the code that we use to build is very prototypey and it's not stable. And now we need security as well and, and DevOps and all of a sudden hire all these people and the whole thing slows to a crawl and now yeah. nothing's getting produced. That's, that's the typical story. Yeah, that's the fear that keeps me awake every night. It's like avoiding okay. that thing. You know, that's, that's the failure mode. Yes, yeah. and have you seen that reality? Oh yeah, absolutely. I have seen that reality. Uh, I've participated uh, uncomfortably in some of that reality. Uh, and I'm fighting like heck to make sure that we don't end up in that reality, for sure. Fantastic. And, and that's yeah. why I want to talk to you now, because it seems that you have escaped that reality. You have lifted into outer space and your engineering capacity is what everyone dreams of, which is producing in large volumes and high quality. Now, it's not just me saying this and it's not just you, Aaron, saying this. So Vendor, which is a unicorn and one of the fastest growing companies today, tech companies today, realized that they needed this ability and you had it and they weren't able to create it on their own and their own engineering team. So they said, we need to go get this. And if we can't build it, we're going to buy it. And so they acquired blissfully for, I'm not going to reveal the price, but it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars of value. So that's their testimony to say, we believe that blissfully is crushing it when it comes to engineering quantity and quality. So therefore, again, we have this third party validation that this exists. So now with that validation, Aaron, can you tell me what does excellence look like? So what, what, what would we see if we went into the output that Blissfully has or that the now vendor has? And then second, can you please tell us how you achieve it? Largely, it comes back to team and ethos. I think that's really the thing that underpins everything. Like we can talk about technical decisions, we can talk about process, but if your ethos is sound and your team believes in it, you go much farther than just trying to throw smart people in a room and praying that you get the right outcome. So, you know, part of that ethos is ownership and urgency. And I think that like every company will say that. So like, let me dig a layer deeper on that because, you know, these are the things that keep me up at night. I think like a great engineering leadership is probably some bizarre mix of optimism and anxiety, right? And somehow the magic happens in the tension between those two things. But one of my favorite quotes, and I know you've heard this, is that software is eating the world. And I like to add on an addendum to that. But software eats other software first. Because the moment a company has figured out that, oh, here's an amazing, you know, go-to-market opportunity, a product people really want, awesome, the copycats start coming in because there's no like inherent magic in software in and of itself. You might have network advantage, you might have data advantage, but if we just talk about like feature functionality, there's no magic in that. Anybody can start replicating it once they've seen it's working. So your fundamental advantage is being able to create fast moving teams reliably. If you move faster, on the highest priority issues more frequently than your competition does, if the hill ever changes, you'll get there first. And that's the thing that you have to keep like at the center of all this, which is that like speed really matters. And so when I think about like what, you know, blissfully and now vendors kind of core fundamental engineering ethos, it's what is the shortest time to value and how can we deliver that over and over faster? How can we create the shortest cycle times to deliver customer value? Because we may not get it right the first time, but if we get there fast, we can do it again and again and again and again, right? So really shorting time to value. And that's on the, 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 the sort of engineering side. That's what engineering is responsible for. 
And the other thing that makes sure that short time to value is really, do you have better customer empathy than your competition? Do you have a better instinct on what you should be building? And are you willing to ruthlessly prioritize uh, to do so? And I think if you look at a bunch of companies across the sort of five levers, tech, talent, systems, empathy, and prioritization, you can find dysfunction. So like I've just kind of thrown a lot at you and I'm willing to like deep dive into any of this because it gets into everything from hiring to code to, you know, like everything. So let's start with the one that I think is most controversial and, um, and everybody wants it, but people feel like they don't know how to achieve it. And that is talent, yep. especially now that we've had this world where we've had two big external events that have said, whoa, cut costs dramatically in the pandemic in early 2020. And then now uh, interest rates going up and the stock market, you know, revenue multiples, uh, valuations of tech stocks, you know, going way down to 90 percent. These are two external events that said cut costs dramatically. And we've seen those companies that cut costs dramatically in March 2020, they cut 5 percent, 10 percent, 50 percent of their company. They saw that productivity actually went up. So now you have a yes. whole bunch of CEOs that are bought into the idea that talent density really works. That what Reed Hastings yes. was talking about at Netflix, it's actually true, especially in so these creative right. roles of which engineering is, is one. But now there's this other external event. So many more CEOs will learn this that are doing, going to do layoffs now. But there are a whole bunch of CEOs that have already gone through the layoff process and their companies are strong. And they say, I do want talent density, but I don't want to go through a layoff again. Can't I just do this with performance? Can't I just get those who are not performing or performing okay, can I just help them move on to another job in another company, give them a soft landing, retaining only the best? So a continuous role of performance management as opposed to using external events to do layoffs. And the challenge, of course, that they face is as the CEO of a thousand or 5,000 person company, they don't know who the individual people are. So we're going to talk about one, if you have direct access and you can see if you as manager of the team, how do you do continuous, strong performance management, i.e. letting go of the, the non-performers? And then the second question, which you may not have the answer for, because you may not have this big of an entity, how do you get your managers to do that? Because that's a real trick as well. So let's start with you being the direct manager. How do you do it? What, what does best of breed look like? Because I know you do this. Great question. And, I, and, and by the way, I, I just implicitly agree that you cannot rely on external events. You must be doing this continuously. Like you have to be really, you know, open eyed about this. And, and, and just to like, I, I'm sure your audience already knows this, but just in case they don't, like there's real reason to make sure that you have a very, you know, strong eye on performance. Because if you have amazing people, you want to let them know that you know they're amazing and you want to empower them. If you don't know who your amazing folks are, like that is like a really terrible place to be because you can't give them critical path projects. You can't give them prestige projects. You can't let them open throttle and really like show you how good they are. We have amazing people that just keep absorbing everything I throw at them and my mind is just blown. Like, how do you do that? And for the folks in the middle, you need to know who's there because you need to coach them up. They have some opportunity. And they either can become an amazing person or maybe they can't, but you need to know that. And so people need to be trying to help, you know, make them into the best versions of themselves. And lastly, obviously there's the folks that are underperforming and you know, it's a, it's a, that's a tough conversation to have with folks, but they're probably better served being somewhere else. Right. And it's better for both of you if you identify that sooner. So you really have to be open eyed. You have to look at performance. You can't ignore it. It's a very real thing. And if you let low performers stick around, or if you let people who could be better, but not be better, the bar lowers for everybody, especially your best people, people, great people want to work with other great people. If you're not continuously improving the bar for your teams, you're actually probably letting it slide down by default. So it's even worse than, you know, uh, like, Hey, we only deal with it in big events. Like if you're not continuously dealing with it, assume it's going down. Yeah. Quick touch on that. The lower, the lower performers are probably better off somewhere else. And I think what you mean is they will eventually over their career, they may get to be top performers, but it could take many years and that will be accelerated by really good training and startups yep. don't have training programs. Amazon's got training. Facebook's got training. Google's got training. That's where they should be learning. 
not with your startup. Is that what you meant? Yep. Yeah, okay. absolutely. It, it could be a mismatch of your ability to train. It could be a mismatch on you know their passion. It could be a mismatch on manager. Some people might just need like they've never been told that they could be doing better in strong enough terms. There's all sorts of reasons. And I think one kind of trap for managers at the edges is thinking, oh, it's my fault. I could be doing more. I could be doing better. That's true to some degree. But at some point, you have to call a spade and spade and say, this is just probably not a fit. And I've only I've done as much as I can, as rapidly as you can, ideally. Uh, and that folks will, you know, uh, find some mixture of those things that makes them the best version of themselves. I, I love, uh, there's that uh, scene from Game of Thrones with Jon Snow, like with the, the axe, you know, uh, or the sword, like staring down the horses. Like, I actually think that for performance management, it's, it's best done by folks who are like living the work with you in a lot of ways. So whether this is your tech lead or your engineering manager or even your other teammates, folks who see what great, you know, looks like they know it because they're living it are best suited to be giving you the feedback and kind of raising the bar and raising the ambition. There's a lot of techniques for this. I'll tell you the one that's most unique to, you know, to vendor now. Um, and I love this. And it's not just about performance management. It's actually about shortening cycle times. Because I think what you'll see is that folks who don't achieve short cycle times, who don't achieve ownership, those are the things you want to you wanna work on. And so if you've got a system that shortens cycle times and people resist the system or they don't kind of the system doesn't help them, that's an area you, you should focus on. So we have this unique, um, this unique thing called rubber ducking. And, and that's, that term is not unique. I think every engineer listening to this has probably heard of it, like, and maybe others too. But if you have a problem, put a rubber duck or a teddy bear on your desk and explain it to that, you know, that inanimate object. And generally, you'll solve the problem more often than you would think. Like the act of explaining, of articulating your thoughts crystallizes them and gets you a solution. We actually practice this. We, we, we have uh, one of our engineers, uh, and I'll, I'll give credit to Duncan, when they joined, they, they started a, a Slack channel where they would put out their thoughts as they were onboarding into the organization. This is very early on in our life cycle. And it was just amazing to watch this stream of consciousness of like how they were getting up to speed. And it allowed me to see all the dysfunctions with our onboarding, with our code, with the directions, with what success looked like. And that led to such great improvements. Like, oh, all of our stories need to begin with the end in mind. What does success for the customer look like if we achieve this? Okay, that's a new policy we have in the early days that has spread throughout the entire culture. Oh, you know, the, the tech is hard to work with. I'm seeing it now. Let me go fix it. So folks know this. Shine a light on problems and you can solve them. So now this is part of our standard cultural operating procedure. Every engineer gets a rubber ducking channel. And folks use it to different degrees, but the best engineers really lean into it and will live blog their days. And what's awesome about that is for high performers, you can see how much they accomplish and others in the organization can look at it and go, oh wow, that's what great looks like. I can see it now. It's not someone operating in the dark that you don't hear from until demo day a month later. You literally day to day can learn from the experts externalizing their thoughts. And for folks that need help on something, you know, they might externalize what they're up to. And the moment they hit a problem, say, hey, you know, at Aaron, at Duncan, I need some help. Cool. We don't have to waste time building up uh, context. We can jump right into solving it. And I really appreciate that you were intellectually vulnerable to put all that out there so we could jump right into it. And then we can make it better. Or if they're doing that and they're about to go jump off a dark, you know, cliff, someone can jump in and say, hey, let me save you four days worth of time. Here's what you should be doing. And for underperformers, it's both a, it's a, it's the tool and the signal. If you don't see someone externalizing their thoughts and you have doubts, and I love Frank Slootman's, um, you know, when there's doubt, there is no doubt. Like that's a very powerful phrase. You know, if you don't, if you have doubts about them and they're not externalizing their thoughts, my first go-to is please externalize your thoughts. I can't help you get to success if I don't know what you're struggling with. So by all means do this. And then sometimes you can actually really help them improve. That's the feedback. If I hear the same update a couple days in a row, that's a problem. But if you externalize this, you know, we can really make it better. So this shortens cycle times from like waterfall to, you know, agile sprints to literally on the daily, we're watching people improve and helping others improve. It's amazing. And that requires that's a awesome. few things though. Yeah, it requires that your interview process really look for people with intellectual vulnerability. Right. And so like one of the things I do, which is kind of controversial, actually, 
there's like this whole thing in engineering. Don't ask leap code questions during an interview, right? That's considered like poor form these days. Like we don't do leap code problems. Why are you asking those? Well, I will tell candidates, I'm going to ask you a leap code problem and you're not going to get the solution in the time allotted. And that's not a challenge. It's going to be too hard for you. We only have 30 minutes on this and it's going to be too hard. What I'm looking for is, are you capable of verbalizing your thought process while you struggle? Because if you have that key ingredient, I can make you better, right? And our team can make you better and we can help you learn really rapidly and just get on this amazing trajectory. And if you can't do that, it doesn't matter how good you are. You might've gone to the best school, this, that, or the other thing. It's like, well, I, I, I actually, I, I don't know that we're gonna be able to work well together. I don't know that we're gonna be able to kind of shorten cycle times and like cross pollinate you know, best of breed solutions and go faster. So this tool both makes our team better, helps us find problems, and really lets the people who are excellent kind of amplify that behavior across the organization. So on these Slack channels, these Rubber Duck Slack channels, does everybody have their own or is it one common Rubber Duck channel? No, everybody has their own. It's your own space. It's your room. You get to hold court in there. Whatever you want to do, by all means, go for it. Your teammates will probably be in there. If you're one of our superstar engineers, everybody might be in there. Ryan, our CEO, is in a few of them as well because he gets to follow along with what's happening, which is obviously thrilling for you know someone who's like the downstream consumer of product to see the sausage getting made at Clip. Like that's just cool. Fantastic. So each room is public to anybody who wants to view, but there's only one yeah. person writing into it. Amazing. That's right. Like most of what happens now inside Vendor is under this build in public flag, which is put it out there, shine a light on it. And it requires, again, that vulnerability. It requires trust that we're not gonna come in and stomp on your dreams and poo poo what you're working on. And, and that's a problem, you know, like when we see that, we'll address that behavior. But if we create the right environment where people can be kind of broadcasting all of this stuff, the cycle times just collapse and the problems get discovered so much earlier and you're not waiting, you know, six weeks to find something. And, and, that's and, and that's, again, that, that cycle time that's, that helps us shorten time to value. And the yes. other side of this, since I, I, I like dip my toes into the interviewing process, is well, let's talk about value. You know, when, when we hire people, and I can actually talk about some of our best engineers, they don't have computer science backgrounds. They didn't go to Stanford. I went to Carnegie Mellon. They look nothing like that. They are people that are able to take a product or an idea from nothing to something because they have an innate sense of what success looks like. And maybe they get there because they practice that skill a lot, but we really try to hire engineers that have demonstrated product thinking. I mean, even better screening for that upfront, but during the interview process, I will ask them to design product with me. And engineers might wonder why they're doing that, but it's because if you have a better sense of what success looks like innately, we'll move faster. I don't care if you know what O of N, you know, this, that, or the other thing is, like we can help with that and it comes up kind of rarely. And I don't care if you know how a join works this way versus that way. We have a whole team of smart people who can help with that. But do you have a really clear uh, need to define what success looks like from a customer perspective and then drive towards it, right? And that's, that's the other part, like people who innately get what value is. No, those are sort of the folks you really wanna anchor on. Fantastic, makes complete sense. And then, so let's jump to the, the, the harder question then. So how specifically do you evaluate who your non-performers are? And two, what do you do about it? Folks that are not living up to those values of ownership, urgency, drive, transparency, you know, um, collaboration, these are the signals. I, I, think, I think the real trick is not identifying poor performers. It's making sure that people think about performance. I think it's just too easy to turn a blind eye to it. Actually, and if I'm like, I, I, that's the basis. You have to care about performance. That's number one. And I think everybody would sort of agree, yes, we care about performance. Okay, cool. So you're looking at it. And if you're looking at it, have you had an inkling about underperformance? If you've had even the sense that that's happened, but you didn't do something about it, that's where the whole system starts collapsing. I actually think it's like, it's, it's that s simple uh, in a way, it's really hard because humans do not want to tell others, I think you could be better, right? I think you could do better. I think this could have been better. It's very hard to give that feedback. And I had a very critical mother. So like, it was very easy for me to like start doing that with others. It's like baked into my, my particulars of my family growing up. Like we're all very like critical of one another. And I've developed a little more empathy over the years to like channel that in productive ways, I hope. Um, but so I think that's, that's, that's sort of the start of it. Um, and if you see folks 
uh, doing the same thing, you know, two days in a row, like that should be the clearest signal to you that something's wrong. Um, so, uh, so, so I, let's I say so talking about short like cycle times, most oh, yeah. people do performance reviews once a year. Some people do some groups do them every six months. You're saying faster. If you have an inkling, you then have 24 hours to see whether or not that improves. If on the second yeah. day it hasn't improved, you need to talk to that person and mention it directly to them. Because if the performance evaluation only sits in your head, but it's not coming out your mouth into their ears, then it doesn't exist. So That's you right. give people 24 hours from thought to voicing of, oops, this doesn't feel good. That's right. That's exactly right. And, and in fact, you know, I think that should be your default mode for all feedback, like especially around engineering. It's okay if people are learning. It's okay if they're struggling. But if they've done, if, if they're not making progress one day to the next, you know, you just can't let it go past that. Because if you are letting it go past that, you're just deluding yourself. You're just assuming, well, they're distracted. I'm busy, you know. And then that just creates this cascade of people ignoring what are obvious problems. Like other people have noticed that too. You noticed it. You have to address it. It's hard. It's really hard. But you can't look away. Um, yes. And yeah. And then, you know, so, I, I think with, with engineers, by the way, just to, to go a little bit further in that, like, you know, 60, you know, six months, 90 day, 60 day reviews. I think in the first two weeks, in a lot of cases, you will know who your top performers are likely to be. And you will know the people that are struggling that really are going to need attention in two weeks. Like you should really, you'll have a good sense very, very fast. And you might say, well, we didn't onboard them successfully. Our tech was difficult. We didn't do this, that, or the other thing. That all may be true. Your top performers will navigate around that. They will clamor for clarity and they will pull whatever they need to start going right away. They will make themselves known. And the folks you don't hear anything from, terrible sign. The silence means that they're not going to self-drive towards success. And, and you either have to help them or swiftly correct it. So there you are, you're in the first two weeks and you now know of this new class of 10, it's these three that are kind of quiet and holding back and not performing, not like these other four up here that are just absolutely crushing it. What do you yep. do with those three? You give them very clear feedback on that, uh, for sure. Um, I think- Well, you've already you, done that because- Oh, you've, you've already, already done that? Well, you part, you, you, part, you, you part ways. Like if someone doesn't, if someone does not respond to your feedback and they're not improving, I think you need to just part ways really rapidly. Um, that's really- and How hard. long do you wanna, give them I, to respond? Yeah, um, you know, that's a tough one for me to answer uh, in a way that's gonna be satisfying to either of us because, you know, it really like, even my heart strings, I'm, I'm giving you all this like high performance, this, but like, uh, I, sometimes I just feel for people. I want you to succeed, but it's not happening. Um, you know, we've let people go within 10 days of hiring them. Uh, we've let people go within three weeks of hiring them. Uh, it's, I don't relish that. I think it means there was a mistake somewhere in our hiring process and we should go address that afterwards, but you can't let your mistakes, uh, you can't own them so fully that you don't take corrective action, both on the situation and on the system defe deficiency that got you there. So, you know, in an ideal, in an ideal, ideal world, we're talking about four weeks from, you know, hire to, you know, calling a spade a spade. If it was the wrong fit, uh, that would be about the upper limit. Um, that's the ideal world. I think you do better than that still, but you really do need to move very fast. I don't want to claim too much faster than that because I think that's like, you know, you have to make sure you do your homework on, on some dimension here and like really sometimes you can turn people around. So it does require that you put in the effort to do it. So the trick is just identifying it and addressing it as fast as possible. I think if you do that, then you'll see if someone turns on a dime. And if they don't turn on a dime, you know, you really, you're, you're going to struggle long term. Yeah, perfect. So what I'm hearing you say is from doubt to let's help you find another place is maximum 30 days. It's likely you're going to let them know immediately. And if they're going to turn, they're going to turn within a week or two. And if they don't, yep. it's done. Yep. And yep. That's okay, right. that makes in complete sense. Now, people are gonna have a fear. I'm gonna share what the fears are. One, what if I'm wrong? What if they really could have turned it around? What if, if I'd given them another two months, they would have made it. And now I've gotta spend two months hiring another person that has no more likelihood of success. Why is my team gonna be better? Because now there are lower level things that they could have gotten done. Yes, they would have taken a long t longer time than the best performers, but they're here, they're already on board, they're, 
they're doing something. Why is that something? Why is it better to have nothing than something? Because the, the something... I know the answer to this already, but I want to hear you say yeah, it. Yeah, the something dilutes the people who are doing really well. And it prevents you from getting even better people in. It, it, nothing is stable and, and additive. Everything is multiplicative. Every person is a, a, a fraction that multiplies your entire team. Are they a, a, a two over one? That's amazing. They're going to make everybody else extremely good. Are they a one over two? They're going to sap resources from everybody else. Maybe they're only three quarters, right? But three, three quarters, you know, multiplied together. And I can't do the math in my head, but like that will like really drag your team down really fast. So it's not that they're not contributing something. They are, but they are also holding a spot from someone that could have been multiplicative and could have been a bar raiser. And they are taking from the rest of the team. And if your best performers see that there are other people that aren't that great, who are just being coddled or, you know, kind of left to flap in the winds, which is not good for them either. Like, I mean, it's just a terrible place to be. Uh, that drags everybody down. And that will cause people to want to leave because the best people want to work with the best people. They want to get better too. They don't want to be strictly helping others. They want it to be like, oh, I'm making you better. You're making me better. That's the best kind of team. There's an energy creation when the only people in the room are top performers. There's like yeah. an intangible and you, and you don't know it until you see it, but you'll never see it if you have non top performers in the room. That, that's a great point. That's a really great point. Once you've seen truly excellent people on their own, and then you've seen truly excellent people work together, it is really hard to want to go back from that. Like it is really hard to tolerate, you know, folks who are just not in the right place for them, kind of not doing their best work and not doing the rest of their team justice, it gets really hard. So like, if you don't feel like you've seen true excellence, go find it because I guarantee you your worldview will change like overnight. And so I think like probably leaders in organizations know what true excellence looks like, but they have to work with everybody else in their organization to make sure of that. So if you ask your sort of like managers and leads and directors, if they haven't seen true excellence, if they can't point to it and say, this person really is excellent and you go, oh yeah, then you need to expose them to that right away <laughs> because that is, a, that is a key learning is to see what like amazing looks like because it's out there. It's definitely out there. Fantastic. Love it. Now, I'm going to get into some details here. I haven't done this before. I'm a manager. I haven't let people go before. Um, I go to my, I have doubt about a performer. I go to them and then they tell me, hey, there's something going on in my personal life. What are I as a manager supposed to do? Like, I can't touch that, or at least it's a story I tell myself, but their performance isn't there. How long do I let them deal with the issue in their personal life? And they won't talk to me about it because it's personal and that they, they want to draw a line between business and personal, but it's affecting their work performance. What yeah. do you do? That's a really, really tough one. Um, I've, and, and I think it's tough because we're all humans who care about each other. We should be. If you're not hiring people that care about one another, like it's, it's, it's game over already because that's not a, that's not a good environment either. Um, I, I, I think that the key is expectation setting from both sides, meaning it is okay if you're struggling. That happens. Like it absolutely happens. But what's not okay is when you're not communicating that struggle back to your manager uh, or your team setting those expectations, not the details, obviously, but setting the expectations of, you know, your own availability, this, that, or the other thing. You know, a lot of times I'll ask people to go on vacation. I, I think sometimes it's, 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 it can be that simple. Now, some problems are like longer ranging and, and they don't have simple solutions, but it's like you're struggling with something like by all means, multitasking your way through, you know, to a solution may not be appropriate. So let's, let's set some expectations. You're not around for the next you know, week or two. Okay. That's at least we're going to try to compartmentalize this if it's compartmentalizable. If it's mm -hmm. not, you need to work with your manager to set expectations so that folks kind of know, you know, uh, what's, what you're going to be there for and what you can achieve. And, and I, you know, again, I don't have a great answer for this one because it, it does happen and it's just really challenging. I think when you set expectations and then likely what ends up happening is they're still not met and it turns out it's not the person's personal life and personal struggle that's the issue it's just their, their sort of approach to how they relate to their work and their life 
Uh, and that's a knot that is really hard to untangle. You as a manager may not be able to untangle it, but if you've set clear expectations and agreed on them and then folks can't meet them, what else can you do? Like that, that is the, the only tool I think folks really have is just try to be clear eyed about it, find a mutual agreement. And if we can't meet that, we have to say, this is probably not the right fit. If you've got better answers for this, by the way, I'm open to it because like that is one of the more challenging things I think in terms of performance management is like people are human. Humans have messy lives. How do we kind of create the right environment for you to be your best self while acknowledging those struggles? Yeah. So here's how we do it inside our org. We're 12 people. Um, I have everybody, I coach everybody, not only on their work life, but also on their personal life. The personal life only usually lasts the first three months that they're here because we usually are able to figure, make it so much better that then it's like a 10 out of 10 and, and people are like, oh my God, that's amazing. And then of course, we're the only place they ever want to work because what other manager on the planet would help them make their personal life better. But we see the results are highly correlated to their work performance, not just loyalty, but also work performance. Occasionally, we have someone who says, listen, my personal life is my personal life. It's off limits. I say, okay, no problem. Then I can't help you there. Then the only thing that I can judge you on is output, period. So the output right. needs to be here. If you get there by X days, great. If you don't get there, we're gonna have to part ways. Got and it. frankly, that's yeah. only happened once. Everybody else actively appreciates the coaching and the help in their personal life. And it makes a huge difference, especially for people who work remotely. We found that most people have a really bad work from home setup that is really kind of anxiety inducing. And we just help them follow best practices, clean up their work from home environment. And all of a sudden, oh my God, they're, they're happy again. It's usually because they're, yeah. they're not leaving their apartments. So they don't see other humans. They don't go outside. They don't get natural air or they're sitting in the middle of their kitchen and other people are constantly walking by, so we're constantly getting interrupted. We saw, yeah. usually solve those three problems, and then suddenly people's mental health goes I, 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 straight I, up. I, I, I love it, I love it. I mean, I think I was kind of going straight to that extreme where someone's being very sort of like closed off about their personal life, which, which does happen. I think if you're finding people that are, want to be high performers, they are good collaborators, they practice intellectual vulnerability, they're probably actually a little bit better at emotional vulnerability because they're, they're very you know, intertwined. It's the same thing. Yeah, we, we have had those conversations of what people are struggling with. And sometimes it ranges from simple things like, hey, just let your partner know that during this moment, you know, like you need some focus time all the way through like very dark life events. But if you're like, a, if you're, if you really care about people, you have, you know, like you have to care about your people, then you get to that, that good, uh, that good vibe. And I hadn't thought about it as like coaching personal lives, just kind of like being there for people and the holistic sense. Um, I love that. That's, that's great. But before we leave the talent, we did how you do performance evaluation and your cycle time to letting people go when they're not performing, which is excellent. You shorten, you compress those times dramatically. The second piece is what if it's not you? What if it's you're the manager and it's your report, it's their team or even worse, it's your reports, reports team. And now you don't know if they're performing or not performing. Now, of course, with these rubber duck channels, you would actually have visibility all the way down. Yeah. But if you didn't, think, so that actually is a solution. You'd see all the way it, through. It, 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 it helps. I mean, I, I think in general that, you know, that adage that like, you know, sunlight's the best disinfectant is just, is just a, a great truth in any area of your life, right? If there's fog mm -hmm. of war, remove the fog, get a sense of the terrain, and then you can really solve for issues. So, you know, one thing that I, I like to personally do is we can talk about general problems that, that people are having or their team are having, and that's helpful, but it's also helpful to look at specifics and then look at the systems that led to those specific issues. So like if I doubt that, you know, a team is performing well, and maybe I'm not gonna get in there and like work with that team, Okay, well, why, you know, like, why am I having that doubt? Let's look at some specifics and let's look at what led to those specifics, right? So, you know, if the team is not demonstrating strong ownership, right? Like uh, the product's not getting done. We look into it. Someone's sort of just throwing stuff over the wall. Okay, they don't have ownership. Why don't they have ownership? 
Now I'm going to look at the manager and saying, well, you know, really, you, you really have to help drive this culture of ownership. Like that is, we know why this is key. You know, the principle of why ownership is key, right? Because it's about, you know, that urgency, that customer value. So why aren't, you know, why aren't you identifying this, you know, to us? Why aren't you helping your team live this? And then try to correct those kind of like upstream systematic problems. So that's sort of like the, the, the lens at which I look. If it's that far away from me, it's probably a systems issue, really. You know, it might be a single manager issue, but like, how did that happen? Why aren't we evaluating the managers in that way? And the other one's just cross-team calibration. So again, once you know what excellence looks like in an organization, you can compare this to this to this to this. And just you, you can, I mean, I, maybe naive, I mean, you just sort of like see it a little more clearly when you compare, look what this team is up to. Look what this team is doing. This team is not. Let's go debug this. And, and that's, again, when you kind of get to that ground truth and, and get dirty. I, I, I don't, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know how long this will scale for, but I really think getting your hands dirty and getting into it with folks and really talking about the very specifics of what's going on is the way to help people realize their own, like, gaps that they've had. Um, and hopefully you're training, you know, all your various layers to go do this, but like get into it. You really have to get into it. If you don't get into it, you're guessing, you're stabbing in the dark and you're, you can't speak to the specifics that the folks that need the feedback uh, would understand and be able to like actually adjust based on that, right? I need you to have more ownership. Oh, okay. Truism, of course. Yeah. On it, boss. But like, let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about that time that we saw there wasn't enough ownership. Oh crap. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. I could have done better on that. So thank you for, you know, thank you for getting and so, specific. To be specific it. here, when you say get your hands dirty around individual problems, does that mean when the manager comes and talks to you in your one-on-one, -on -one, you say, let's go through a specific problem and why did that problem occur? Okay. Then why did that thing occur? Okay. Then why did that thing occur until you get to the root yep. cause? Or do you mean going even further and saying, hey, manager, I'm going to attend your next team meeting and I'm going to ask those same questions, not just of you, but of the entire group so that we see from everybody's perspective, why did that happen? Why did that happen? Why did that happen? More in that order, actually. I would probably start with the individual and say, hey, let's talk about specifics so that I can arm you with the tools to address those specifics while you and I together can fix the systems that led to these problems in the first place, right? Perfect. If we come back with that same problem again, we're going to go deeper, right? Now mm -hmm. we're going to go one layer deeper beyond this. And we're going to perform that analysis all over again, except this time it'd be a little bit closer to, to ground truth. So, you know, it's not, it's not about subverting people's authority and going above their helmet, you know, or whatever it might be. It's about like, here's the issue. Let's talk about it. Okay. Here's your tools to address it. Here's the system tools. We're going to, you know, bolster to avoid this in the future. And if we're running into this again, we're going to go, we're going to expand, you know, our purview a little bit deeper. Makes sense. Makes sense. So what happens if you're the CEO, you've got a head of engineering, so your report manages the entire thing. You don't know what excellence looks like. You don't think it's there, but you're not sure. And your head of engineering says, all my people are just are fine. I, I think that's a problem. And not only on that, all my people are fine. And I want more, 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 more. Just give me more budget, more budget, more budget, more budget. I want to be able to hire, you know, 100%, double the team in this coming year. And everybody I, here I, is great. I think everybody always wants more budget, wants more team, wants more projects, more authority, more power, more fun. Everybody wants that. That's a, that's a given. But if you're not feeling it, there's an issue. Like you need to feel it. It could be, it's very, I mean, let me make a, a wild assertion without basis. It feels like it's probably rare that a team is high performing and the folks above them don't feel it. Like when does that happen? When is a team super high performing and the team and the folks that care upstream don't feel it? Like show me that. Cause I would love to like go debug that one. Like someone's probably like literally working against their team to keep that, that enthusiasm, that success contained. So if you're not feeling it, it's probably not there. <laughs> like, trust your gut. And this comes back to, you know, your gut may not have the answers. Your gut may not know specifically what's wrong, but your gut is actually a better signal than any, you know, mathematician or scientist might sort of suspect inherently. Like it, there's truth coming out of that. So if you're not feeling it, yeah. it's probably just not there. Yeah, makes complete sense. Another thing that's been thrown out to me, and I'm curious, this may, it, just, it may not be the perfect tool, but it is a tool, 
is to give a very specific number. This is the budget that you have to pay for your team. And if you want more people, that's great. Let go of your lower performers to open up the space to hire even better people. Now, yep. what that tends to do is it tends to, to quiet people down. They no longer clamor for more and more hiring because now they have the ability to create it for themselves. But it also those managers who are afraid to let people go, it does cause them to start hiring less. So it doesn't actually have the full intended effect, which is aggressively go higher and then make sure that you stay within the budget by letting go those who aren't keeping up. Yeah, but 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 you're but you're stopping the 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 bleed in a way, right? Because what you're saying yes. is, if you're not bar raising, we're not going to double down on you adding people that are uh, less than one fraction to your team. That's how you That's hit right. asymptotes, you know. And we don't want right. to find the, we we don't want to find your ceiling. If we found That's your ceiling. Right. Like that's an issue. We always yes. want to find people that have more trajectory above them, not because they're starting low, but because we just haven't found it yet. We haven't found, we haven't found the limits of, you know, what they're capable of doing, you know, and it might yes. it, like, that's a cool feeling. That's a really cool feeling. Yes. And then the other suggestion that's come to me, this came from Steve Huffman at Reddit and his solution is, is, and it alludes to what you talked about before, which is people who sort of have aspiration and at the same time, extreme anxiety. And yeah. so he hires people for people who have that. You can tell when people just like, they're nervous, they're, they're like, they're never satisfied. They're always, they're, they're, they, they beat themselves up, frankly. And oftentimes yeah. these are firstborns and they're like, they, and it, 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 it may be painful to live that life. And, but those people have a sense of urgency and they're never satisfied and they're always looking for how can we improve even a little bit. And that then, because anytime you don't have that sense of urgency in a ladder, it kills the chain of urgency. Yeah, totally. Well, so number one, I can empathize with those people deeply because I feel like that's, that's exactly the crippling, uh, the crippling world in which I lived under uh, for a long time and to you know, large part still do. But that is ownership, right? Like that is ownership. To be an owner, to be a parent, right? That is to be like highly anxious about all manner of things going wrong, things not working as well as you hoped they would, customers thinking, oh, this is kind of crappy. Like it sucks, but that's the kind of hyper consciousness that leads to people understanding where the gaps are and caring to fix it because that's how they sort of self-soothe in that way, right? It's just being better. You know, I think there's, there's ways to get people that are both anxious and that's where the urgency and the ownership comes from in productive ways. And the trick is to find those folks and help them be, to, to deliver on that, that, that sort of need without it harming them along the way. I actually think you can find those folks and coach them into being better. At least there's like a recent discovery for me in the past couple of years, but I think that's very true. I think that's exactly where ownership comes from. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The extreme version of that anxiety is, ah, oh, the world, you know, I'm, I'm a victim. I can't even, I'm paralyzed. That's not what you're looking for. People who right. feel the anxiety and act on it. They, 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 exactly. That's exactly it. They, they know they have a tool. That's actually why partially they're anxious. They know they could yeah. be better. They've seen that's themselves right. do better. Right. And they know if, if only I just prioritized better, if only I had more time, if only I got a better team around me, I could do better. Cool. Okay. We can, we can work with that. We can make that better. People who want ownership because it's an ego thing. Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. that, that is not where good ownership comes from. That's where yeah. territorialism comes from defensiveness, you know, e ego, ego is the enemy, that whole thing. Like that's a, it's the, that's not where ownership comes from. High ego people. Uh, I mean, you maybe have high ego and high anxiety. I don't know, but like that's a that on its own is not is not a good place to be. Aaron, this has been fantastic. I don't want to hold you any longer. We've taken up a ton of your time, but I want to summarize. I think the key points here. The key points are, at least as I remember them, as we go through, is one: talent density really matters. And if you haven't seen real excellence, which is a phenomenal output person or a group of only phenomenal output people then you don't know what you're missing. So first, go see that, go find it. Once you go see it, you'll never wanna go back again. Once you go stay in a first class hotel, you'll never wanna go stay in the two star hotel again. And then you'll know the difference. And when you do, you'll be motivated to let go of all the folks who aren't five star, because within your team right now, there are five stars. 
you just have to let all the remainder go to get purely five stars. The second thing is the way that you achieve that and understand how people are performing or not performing is you have individual Slack channels called rubber duck channels for each person where they get to literally live stream their thought process and their struggles with the things that they're working on each and every day. And if they do that, one, if they just describe the problem, all of a sudden for most 90% of the time, they figure out the answer they on their own, answer. right? 10% of the time, you or the head of engineering or somebody else can jump in, read and go, hey, I've encountered that problem before. Here's how I fixed it. Boom. So for that, you can also solve the 10% quite easily. So now you see the people who are thinking out loud are likely the ones who are going to be performing better. The ones who aren't using that channel, that, they're the ones that you know you need to sort of talk to and prompt to use that channel. And if they, if they start to and they start to encounter the same problem over and over again, then you go to them and say, hey, you coach them a little bit more directly, not through the Slack channel, you call them up, you have a meeting. And if after, and you do this, by the way, the first time you have the thought, you give them 24 yes. hours to see if they can figure it out on their own in the, in the rubber duck channel. But if they can't, then you come to them and say, hey, this is what you need to do. And then if they can't do that within two weeks, let me help you find another place. The other thing yeah. too is that, you know, it, it, it's showing others what excellence looks like. Airing excellence more frequently really does help everybody truly understand what's possible. And, and you know, the, the mimetic modeling is just so, so real. So it's not just about the low performers, it's amplifying your top performers. And again, everybody's a, a, a multiple. So you want your best to multiply others and you want people to see the techniques and the thought process. And then for the folks that aren't multiplying, you can get in there and hopefully, you know, debug whatever it is that's holding them back and make them better. Or if not, you know, call, call it like it may be. Fantastic. Yes. And amplifying the top performers, if they live blog post, everyone else can see how they think so they can copy that sort of thinking and elevate their own game. Yep. Fantastic. Aaron, this is hugely helpful. Please don't be surprised if rubber duck Slack channels now start appearing. <laughs> across the country. That'd be great. It's a be really great. idea. Awesome. Aaron, this is really great. Thank you very much.